Good morning, everyone. My name is Tendai. I work with the Democracy and Civic Engagement Unit at the Center for Human Rights. I would like to welcome you to our today's webinar in which we unpack um, the unconstitutional changes of government which are occurring on our continent. So our today's uh, panelists, we have Dr. Trizo Mukunya, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the End Publications Coordinator at the Center for Human Rights. We have Ms. Tiseke Kambala, who is the Director of Africa Programs, Freedom House. And we have Ms. Acheng Akena, who is the Executive Director for International Refugee Rights Initiative. I would like to say to our panelists, welcome, and thank you for accepting to be part of this special conversation. So today, I think before we get into the webinar, let's just give a few moments for uh, maybe a minute for, for the participants to join. All right. Once again, welcome. The African continent continues to experience the scourge of military coups in various forms of unconstitutional changes of government. And recently, there has been a new trend of military coups emerging from various parts of Africa, particularly in the West Africa region, which are um, supported by uh, popular uprisings. And um, there has been questions to the nature of these schools and the legality of these schools. And um, various democracy indicators focusing on democracy and constitutionalism on the continent, such as the Freedom House, the World Bank Governance Index, the Fraser Institute to mention a few, they have expressed concern on the declining democracy standards on the continent. And the nature of this coups, which are supported by popular uprisings, brings up to, to, to the nature of today's debate. In 2017, we saw in Zimbabwe, for instance, when the former president Mugabe was hosted, we saw Zimbabwean citizens rose into the street and supported the military coup. In 2019, the same happened in Sudan when the former president Omar al-Bashir was hosted. Similar trends has been experienced in places such as Mali in 2021. And recently in Burkina Faso, we saw the same trends. So now this brings us to the question of the legality of these schools. What's the future of constitutionalism in Africa, given the nature of this, um, of this phenomenon? So I'd like to start with Dr. Trizo. What's your take on the current trends in nature of the current coups that we're experiencing on the continent? And what is the legality of these coups that are supported by popular uprisings? And finally, how can the existing legal instruments or the legal system we have on the continent be strengthened to bring this sketch to a halt? Dr. Trizo, could you give us your thoughts and your remarks on what's happening on our continent. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Tendai. I would like to to extend my gratitude to the Democracy Civic Engagement Unit uh, to have me on this uh, panel. It's a pleasure and honor uh, since been collaborating on a few other uh, other projects as well. So um, I would like to start by uh, positioning, uh, pointing out that use of government the subject uh, over the recent weeks and months of a few other regional discussions and national discussions. And, and what comes to my mind is, are we not repeating ourselves? Are we not saying the same thing uh, differently on the continent, but nothing is actually... Um, uh, I think it's worth talking about constitutional changes of government, whether we multiply forums in different African countries and uh, within different regional economic communities, because we have to raise awareness about this phenomenon. We have to raise awareness about its uh, adverse impact on constitutionalism, constitutionalism 
and democratic governance in um, in Africa. So we've uh, had in Africa a certain of considerable normative and uh, institutional efforts to try to curb uh, unconstitutional changes of government. At the more uh, normative levels, we've seen that have been uh, enacted, starting with, of course, a, a number of uh, attacks in the mid 1990s by the African Commission to call on African states to African Commission on Human and people right to call on African states to prevent military coups. And then we saw in, 19, in 2000, actually, the Lome Declaration on uh, Unconstitutional Changes of Government, which tried to prevent uh, five types of unconstitutional changes of government. And for those perhaps who are not familiar with those type of unconstitutional changes of government, they include uh, not only coup d'etats, but also uh, the removal uh, of um, democratically elected uh, government and uh, so forth. So we saw after the Lomi Declaration, the enactment of the African Charter on Democracy, Election and Governance. And what was interesting about the African Charter on Democracy and Governance is that it added a fifth element to the definition of unconstitutional changes of government. Which is, uh, which points out to the issue of uh, revising or amending the constitutional the constitution in a way that is not more consensual. So the last normative uh, evolution, in my view, was the late in 2014 with the Malabo Protocol to the Statute of the African Court of Justice and Human and uh, Human and People's Rights, which added a sixth limb to the definition of unconstitutional changes of government. Uh, which is more like when you try to amend electoral laws within six months before before election. So what this tells us is that there is, in fact, a certain awareness at the regional level, a certain desire, the, the willingness to 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 curb this uh, this process. Because from a legal perspective, you can't change a, an adverse phenomenon to constitutionalism without having a robust legal framework. So we saw the emergence of not only soft law standards, the Lomi Declaration, now we have binding standards, and one which is actually enforced is the African Democracy Charter. The Malabo Protocol is yet to be enforced, which tries to actually criminalize and constitute changes of government. On the second level, we saw exactly the institutional development. We see uh, uh, the changes within the African Union from the Organization of African Unity to the Organization of African Union, which tries, when you look at the African the AU Constitutive Act, it tries also to outlaw the unconstitutional changes of government. So there is actually, at the regional level, strong and solid legal uh, framework, but also strong and solid to, the, to a certain extent institutional framework that, that can help us uh, curb um, uh, unconstitutional changes of, of government. Unfortunately, at the same time, we see the emergence of these new norms and we see the emergence of these uh, new institutions. Uh, cases of unconstitutional changes of government are increasing. And as Tendai pointed out in the beginning, we see uh, in the span of less than two years, you see, or three years, you see more than five unconstitutional changes of government. You see kudetas in Guinea, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, you see two kudetas, including one kudeta in one in another coup. And then you see elections being rigged in uh, a number of, of, of countries. So a number of individuals, including scholars, have tried to, to reflect on what uh, could be uh, the cause of this, uh, this uh, phenomenon. The African Union itself, for example, when you look at the, the AU roadmap of practical states to silencing the guns in Africa, it points out a certain number of issues that are leading, that, are, that can be considered as the causes of unconstitutional of government. And this includes the lack of observance of human rights, uh, the lack of good governance, democratic principles, as well as the lack of consensus among key political actors on the management of public affairs. Uh, these are exactly some of the problems we see increasingly on the continent, which uh, points to the fact that the solution perhaps to curbing unconstitutional of government can start at the regional level but the nerve of it has to be done at the domestic level. So um, in my view, we can group these different reasons why we are still witnessing unconstitutional changes of government in Africa, despite the normative and institutional progress. We can group them into the, 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 
the first uh, category should be uh, the inability of the African Union to play its effective role and to prevent unconstitutional changes of government. Why do I talk about the inability of the African Union? I'm not saying that the African Union is completely unwilling to do so, but uh, we have to understand from a legal standpoint that the African Union is a an international organization and more particularly a regional organization, which is composed of member states. So it does not exist on its own. It's made up of member states. And these member states have to be committed to the norms that have been established within the African Union. So oh, if you read the number of to curb and constant changes of government, certain member states do refuse actually to adopt these measures because they are afraid to have the same standards being applied to them in the future. So that's where the African Union is being uh, actually weakened in terms of uh, solving the, the problem. That's one reason. The second reason actually is the lack of commitment to constitutionalism. We saw in the early 1990s, um, the development or the, the amendment of uh, existing African constitutions and the, 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 the adoption of new constitutions, which mainly tried to cement a culture of constitutionalism on the continent through the adoption of um, African Bills of Rights, the establishment of principles such as the separation of powers, and uh, more importantly, the establishment of independent institutions, uh, what we generally refer in South Africa as chapter nine institutions, and robust constitutional jurisdiction, which tries to uphold the supremacy of the constitution. So despite these new norms in the early 90s, we see that no one committed to them. You have new norms, but if you don't commit, if you don't believe that those norms can change and transform your society, if your mindset has remained more authoritarian, you can have nice norms and nothing will happen. And this is what we see in the area of unconstitutional changes of government through what we call the unconstitutional retention of power through the phenomenon of third termism. Third termism being the repeal or the amendment of the constitution by a sitting president in order to obtain a third or an additional uh, term uh, contrary to what the constitution provides. So you have a constitution, we have new constitutions in Africa, but the powers of executive have remained so high to the point that it's really difficult for other institutions to play properly their role without uh, undermining the role of the executive. That commitment to constitutional limit has to come not only from African member states, African Union member states, because it's when you commit to the values and principles of constitutionalism that you can, to a certain extent, prevent the occurrence of unconstitutional changes of government. Because if you look at uh, uh, the views in countries such as Burkina Faso, in countries such as Mali, it's because the coup d'etats are, are masterminded because elections are actually not enough to, uh, to ensure that people have their voice. The elections are being rigged, and if you can't change, um, if the change of power or the change of government cannot be done through the ballots, then people resort to bullets to change uh, the, the, uh, the government. So that's the second issue of the commitment to values of constitutionalism. And the third issue, which is linked actually to the second, is the democratic deficit. The democratic deficit here, I mean mainly uh, that elections, uh, democracy in many African countries has been reduced to elections, free, fair, and regular elections. And who assesses the fairness and the freedom of elections is actually the national institutions. And some of these national institutions, including constitutional jurisdiction, which have to confirm presidential elections results and sometimes national legislative elections results are controlled by uh, the executive. So these institutions become useless and elections as a mode of devolution of power becomes uh, become as well useless. And people do no longer believe in elections uh, because they, they don't transform, they don't change anything. And what we do is to welcome those who try to take power um, with uh, by force, the military. So one would have expected that the people in many of these countries, when there is coup d'etat, the people will contest those who um, are masterminding uh, the coups. Why? Because we actually have norms that uh, outlaw um, the coup d'etat. But on the contrary, you see that people are actually applauding those who are uh, 
who engineers those coup d'etats. And we have to question that. Why do we have acclamation all over the continent of people who take uh, power by force? Some other scholars have tried now to, 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 to think about how can we constitutionalize coup d'etats? Because we've realized that elections are not actually enough to help us uh, get rid of those dictators or those megalomaniac political leaders in power. So how can we constitutionalize coup d'etats to ensure that coup d'etats are legitimate and legal in a certain number of, of, of circumstances? Scholars have been thinking about it. So another, another uh, reason in my view is uh, actually the inadequacy of the neoliberal model of the post-colonial African states. Uh, because the states, if you look at the way it's functioning today, has become an instrument of personal enrichment and consolidation of power. The African states, in many parts, uh, people want to, to, to go to power, not because they want to serve, they want to transform their societies. Perhaps we do have those, but the majority is not the case. The state has become an instrument where we come to get benefit, we come to, to distribute rents within our inner cycles and to share it, the dividend with uh, the, some superpowers. Uh, some of these, if you look in the Francophone African countries, some of these are our former uh, colonial masters. So you go to power to satisfy not your people, but the people who made your election possible, or those who helped you to rig election. This can be the French or, or, or the other ones, and there are a number of people in your inner circle. So the state has been turned to an economic agent and not a social instrument that will bring development and change within the society. The consequences is that people are sidelined in the manner in which the state function, and they feel like they do no longer be, belong to, to the states. They don't belong. Although you guys at the AU level, you say they should not be unconstitutional of government, people think that the only way for us to take back what belongs to us, which means the state, is to, to, to engineer these coup d'etats. Unfortunately, those who engineer the coup d'etats rare are those who do it in the general interest. The moment they get to power, they're trapped by the system because the system that is in place is a neoliberal system which is trying to ensure that the state only uh, help a certain individual to emerge and the foreign donors and all these other individuals. And at the national level, there's no much transformation. So that problem, we need to think about it. And if I have to, to, uh, to look at another reason is the state-centric definition of unconstitutional change of government today. If you look at um, the early definitions that have been provided of unconstitutional changes of government, uh, the four definitions under the the, um, the Lome uh, declarations, only one was a bit uh, trying to curb the power of those in power, or those in position of leadership. And that was the last one when you try to uh, uh, unconstitutional retention of political powers by meaning that when you've been voted out and you remain, you refuse to relinquish power. That was the only element. But the three other elements were trying to protect the individual who is in power, no matter whether they are exercising the powers uh, uh, contrary to constitutional norms and democratic principles. That does not exist. So today, when you look at the definition of unconstitutional changes of government, whether in the Lomé Declaration, whether in the African Democracy Charter, uh, whether in the Malabo Protocol, none of these instruments try actually to ensure that the way political power is exercised within member states accord with regional and international democratic and constitutional norms. None of them try to do this. The only thing that they try to do is to ensure that you don't take power contrary to what uh, the constitution provides and you don't take power, you don't uh, take power contrary to what international instruments provide. So the main weakness now is when you try to amend the constitution in order to obtain a third or a fourth or a fifth constitutional term, that will not be in the face of the formal international law and constitution because you, you followed all what your constitution has provided. If you look at Ouattara in Côte d'Ivoire, if you look at uh, Alpha Conde in Guinea, what he tried to do, he actually, they actually followed procedural uh, uh, guarantees that are provided within their constitution. But, the outcome is that these individuals will remain in power and the African Union would not condemn that. So the manner in which the definition of unconstitutional changes of government is provided is more state-centric and does not 
resolve uh, resolve the, 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 the problem. And uh, the last point uh, before I give the floor to other individuals will be in my view, um, the disrespect toward regional uh, mechanisms, even when they issue binding binding um, uh, decisions and measures. One of the, the, the key elements in international law is that international law, contrary to domestic law, does not have a binding uh, set of rules without the consent of states. It is based on the consent of, of, of states. States state have to consent to the existence of international norms, of course, apart from custom international law, which has another, another regime. But uh, when it emerges, there should be a certain form of consent as well. But today you have norms at the AU level. You have organs that have been established there. African Union Peace and Security Council. You have the judicial mechanisms and quasi-judicial mechanisms, the African Commission on Human and Peoples, right? You have the African Court on Human and Peoples, right? but all the decisions, whether binding or not binding to some extent, are not followed through by member states. When these organs issue the, the measures to prevent certain issues or to sanction, or to uphold democracy, constitutionalism, human rights, and uh, democratic governance, most African member states do not uh, implement those. If you look at the rate of enforcement of African court decisions, you will see that over 95 judgment of the African court have not been implemented or enforced by uh, states. What you see then is that we have these regional mechanisms only to be used as a talk show, but concretely, there is no change. They are not respected and no one believes in them. Why? Sometimes because certain countries remain still, as it was the case during the OAU or, or era, states remain jealous of their sovereignty. They don't want to receive any, um, any, uh, uh, any order that will not come from their domestic uh, uh, mechanisms or organ. They forget that when they sign and ratify international instrument, where they become members, of uh, international organization, they surrender a part of their sovereignty within the domain of collaboration. This is something that African members, said, especially African heads of state, the moment they come to power, they tend to forget. And if we don't solve some of these issues, I think we'll continue to cry and organize conferences to, to decry the rising uh, trend toward unconscious changes of government, but uh, nothing will change. So I will come back later with uh, a few solutions that I think, but I would want to, to give back the floor to the moderator and to hear other presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trizol, for such a sound um, analysis on the nature of um, unconstitutional changes of government on the continent. And thank you uh, for, for noting that we are at the continent, we have strong legal and institutional framework that prohibits the emergence of these schools to not to explain some provisions within the Long Declaration, the Constitutive Act, the African Democracy Charter, and the Malabo Protocol, which you have mentioned that it criminalizes the unconstitutional chains of government. And it's regrettable that this protocol has not um, come into force yet. And this connects to the idea of member states and willingness to um, adhere to the commitments, their international commitments to uphold human rights and constitutionalism. Thank you very much also for, um, for pointing out that um, lack of trust in, in elections to remove dictatorships on the continent um, has resulted in um, the emergence of these schools, uh, particularly if you look at the, the long um, um, serving dictators, particularly in, our, in the context of, um, of West Africa, where you explained about the um, Alpha Conte in the year in Southern Africa, with Robert Mugabe and, um, and, and many other examples, you could see that lack of trust in elections to remove dictatorships is resulting from um, uh, the emergence of these schools. And um, you also pointed a very important point when you say the inadequacy of the new liberal post-African colonial um, um, states failure to um, satisfy the needs of African citizens is also resulting um, in uh, political tensions and, and resulting in um, unconstitutional changes of government. And also you explained um, uh, something that is important as regards to how uh, the definition of unconstitutional change of government is explained, uh, is provided in, um, in, in law declaration and other 
provisions of the African Union that there are some uh, that uh, um, how the, the the definition is provided is to somehow problematic in uh, in that it's state centric, which is something that is um, notable from from you. And finally, um, allow me to come to Achieng uh, to hear your remarks on. What are the structures that combat this phenomenon and the efficacy of the systems in place? What are, what are your thoughts in that and how these systems could be improved? And uh, it would be interesting to hear from you on the, um, if you could comment on the mechanisms, uh, if there are any mechanism in place that protect uh, the vulnerable groups during uh, the emergence of military coups. We know that uh, often when these military coups, um, women and children, people living with disability, among other vulnerable uh, layers of vulnerable groups are affected. So what's your, and uh, perhaps also you could uh, explain also the interplay between the AU and the civil society groups within states uh, during emergence of these um, military coups and unconstitutional changes of government. Um, kindly give us your overview of your thoughts um, and what you think um on this subject thank you Acheng. over to you uh thank you so much tendai um i apologize i'm not feeling very well so i hope i um, i can be well heard <clears throat> sorry um if i may be allowed to just display Oh, host is okay. I had wanted to display um, a PowerPoint presentation, but it seems it's disabled. But I'd just like to say that, um, as the previous speaker uh, mentioned, um, the, there is quite a few AU uh, normative frameworks that guide um, unconstitutional change of government. I would even argue that the reason why the African Union uh, was established to replace the OAU was this recognition of the need to move uh, from... Um, A Cheng, you are able to share your PowerPoint. Sorry, you are able to share your PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Um, I hope my, um, it's visible. Um, the reason for the establishment of the AU was this recognition that there was a need to move from non-interference to non-indifference. There was a recognition um, of how interconnected uh, the continent was and um, also how interconnected socioeconomic development is to issues of peace and security. So I, I the on my only point of departure from the previous speaker is to say um, that I think our governments know that this is an issue and they know what the connections are. Um, they've been very articulate about uh, the causes of unconstitutional government. Um, and as you can see, they have come, they have gone through several declarations and treaties trying to address the scourge um, uh, from the ACDEG, uh, which seeks to prohibit, reject, and condemn, as well as um, ensure total rejection of unconstitutional change of government, uh, provides for legal and regulatory consequences for those who attempt to remove elected governments, uh, provides a reporting mechanism uh, by the AU uh, I think it's now called the Peace, uh, Political Affairs and Peace and Security Department, and as well as providing sanctions against uh, unconstitutional change of government. You have various mechanisms, including the Ezowini framework, which seeks to enhance the implementation of sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, the Malabo Protocol, again, did that. You have um, APSA, AGA, APRM, which are all trying to um, have some sort of um, early warning or some sort of guideline in terms of the things that uh, that that inf influence or result in unconstitutional change of government. 
Um, however, as the previous speaker said, these have failed to um, have an effect. Uh, my opinion as to why this is uh, would be that one, um, uh, I mean, sorry, before I go there, I would say that I think they, they really do know all these problems and even had an extraordinary summit on it this year. I don't think it's necessarily true that they're all turning a blind eye. I think if that was the case, uh, probably 36 out of 55 countries wouldn't have ratified ACTEG um, and at least 46 signed, which is quite significant. Um, and I think as well, uh, they also they wouldn't have had a high level panel this year as well, uh, which concluded in the Accra Declaration. And the Accra, Accra Declaration actually recognizes um, uh, several uh, uh, causes, I guess, uh, of unconstitutional change of government, uh, including uh, referring to the socioeconomic governance issues that underlie the peace and security issues that include the resurgence of UCG in many African countries. So I would I would argue that they do know and they are concerned about the issue because um, any uh, coup d'etats or instability and conflict in one country have a definite and immediate impact on the surrounding countries, on the economies of the particular region. Um, and, and, and the, you know, beyond even the AU mechanisms, there are regional mechanisms um, that seek to deal with issues of unconstitutional government as well as peace and security in the region. So why do I think that despite all these measures, there have been challenges with stemming the prevalence of UCG across the continent? One, I agree with the previous speaker who said implementation is an issue. Um, I think the last count that I took note of, the AU was saying that less than 10% of all the decisions, declarations, uh, and hundreds of documents uh, with policy implication have a less than 10% implementation rate. So it's just a lack of um, doing the things that they've agreed upon. Um, but also, <clears throat> I, I, I would think that the reason why UCG takes such a state-centric perspective is because um, the issues uh, sorry, the, the, the treaties or these documents that are signed, these agreements that are signed are made by states. Um, though there has been some recognition, I think the, the AU at least has come out clearly to talk about what we call the will of the people, um, where the people have gone into the streets and demanded change in government, like we saw in Sudan and in other countries uh, across the continent. Um, and they still have not elaborated too much on the will of the people. But I would also argue a lack of participation of the so-called people uh, because our, uh, in that sense, I do agree with the, the speaker that our bodies are very about governments. Um, and in this, case, in this case, I would separate government from state. Uh, they're very much about governments and very much about um, uh, governments going to summits once a year and very little accountability for what those summits hold, very little accountability for the decisions that are taken. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> ah, forgive me. Uh, um, and very little um, account, very little demand also for that accountability. I think it's a, a, a double-edged sword where um, the more ineffective the AU come, becomes, uh, the more dismissive people are of the institution. And therefore, um, governments as well hold on to their sovereignty and do not defer any of that sovereignty to a uh, regional body, um, which is required. And despite the several um, 
efforts that have been made towards reconstituting the African Union, it still hasn't reached the state where um, it can apply effective action against countries that fail to implement their commitments. Uh, and that is a big gap that we have. I would also argue that there's a lack of effective or legitimate leadership across the continent. I think that this severely hampers um, any response to uh, governments that are uh, continuing to stay legitimate and illegitimately uh, because there's no one who can hold the other people to account uh, for their uh, for their lack of uh, you know or their, their 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 betrayal of their constitutions and their people. There's nobody. They, there always needs to be somebody who stands up and draws a line, uh, like Macky Sall did with uh, Yaya Jame. So there has to be somebody who draws a line and says uh, beyond this, this is unacceptable behavior uh, of a leader. And I think that we are severely lacking in effective uh, or legitimate leadership across the continent. I think there's also a loss of the Pan-Africanist outlook. <clears throat> the things that uh, pushed off or, you know, the, the, the Pan-Africanist forefathers to bring together uh, the continent uh, as an African Union, I think a lot of that is lost and countries are much more insular dealing with internal problems. And there's very little um, sense of uh, the unity that led to the establishment of the OAU or uh, this restructuring of the OAU <laughs> into the African Union. Um, and, and finally, I do agree with the comments made by my, by my pre predecessor about what marks a democracy. Um, is it elections every five years? We have found in our continent that that's not the case. Uh, is it the people? Is it their quality of life? I think that question also needs to be um, unpacked at some point, but maybe not at this particular uh, time. Um, there has been collaboration, or at least uh, uh, in paper, uh, requests for like, collaboration with civil society organizations. So, for example, in the reporting on ACTE, uh, or AGA, uh, which falls under PAPS, has um, often uh, uh, been open to receiving uh, alternative reports from civil society. They also include civil society in their high-level dialogues that they have every end of year, the high-level dialogues in the, around democracy and governance uh, across the continent. Um, and, and that includes partnership with different organizations on the high-level dialogue. Uh, I think in collating information under AP APRM, which has been seen over the years, to have collected critical information um, towards a, a country's either successful or unsuccessful democracy, including um, predicting the 2007 uh, post-electoral violence in Kenya. Uh, that, that process of collecting information for the African peer review mechanism has included civil society. There's also sort of an early warning briefing function under <laughs> the Livingstone formula, which allows civil society to brief the Peace and Security Council about peace and security concerns that they have in, in their countries. The Accra Declaration, which is the most recent declaration done, I think, really to update the, the Lome and Algiers and El Zulwini declarations, um, it calls for active engagement of not just member states, but also citizens uh, to resolve the underlying factors on, of unconstitutional government. However, there remains serious distrust of civil society by our governments. Uh, for some reason, African governments seem to continuously be afraid of their people and their formations, including civil society. Um, there's an accusation that civil society is externally funded and therefore uh, not legitimately elected to represent the people. Um, 
And yet civil society continues to uh, not just uh, supplement the roles of government across the continent, but also uh, um, not just supplement the roles of government across the, sorry, the continent, but also uh, provide an, an adequate check and balance for the thriving of a democracy in any country. Um, but because of this mistrust, this distrust, uh, any uh, significant contribution that civil society has made, not just to our regional mechanisms, to our, our continental institution, but also to the development of many of these uh, declarations and other documents and instruments which the AU has collected, um, has been downplayed, uh, underplayed, and not given due cre credence over the years. Um, and I, I would, on the issue of uh, vulnerable people, um, I think that this may be the big missing link. Um, I think that when unconstitutional government, I mean, unconstitutional changes happen in a country, especially where violence then erupts, um, I don't think there is any separation of people in general or any consideration of specific vulnerable groups. There is a mention of them in the Accra Declaration, but just as, as a line that uh, states must protect vulnerable groups. But um, I was not at the, the high level forum that came up with this declaration. <laughs> but from the declaration at all, it doesn't look as though there has been some reflection on what these or who these vulnerable groups would be and how they are specifically impacted by unconstitutional change of government, as well as um, how they uh, uh, can be specifically protected, uh, particularly women um, who face a lot of sexual violence, especially in uh, electoral related violence, as we saw in, in my country, Kenya, which is where I keep making reference to. Um, <clears throat> and so I would, I would um, argue that this is a big area that is, is missing in, in specific protection. There is protection for other vulnerable groups from the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, which has special mechanisms that are uh, aimed at protecting people, um, but they're not specifically linked to, to unconstitutional change of government or any electoral related violence or any violence arising from, excuse me, from UCG. Um, maybe Chair, I will leave my presentation there and take any questions that may arise afterwards. Thank you very much, um, Seke, for um, for such a, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Acheng, for such a, an insightful uh, presentation. Uh, it's well researched, and um, you really it's refreshing to hear fellow African citizens uh, reiterating that our governments know what is right, and um, uh, the fact that there have been so much, so much. Uh, that has been done to discuss on and um, to discuss and the instruments that have been adopted at the continental level to address unconstitutional changes of governments. Uh, it shows that the, our government governments know what they are supposed to do. Um, and thank you very much for pointing out the existing mechanisms that we have on the continent and um, how they can be used and for also pointing out the challenges that we uh, that are there at member state level implementing um, the decisions that have been adopted at the continental level and it's very worrying that 10 less than 10 percent of the decisions and declarations of the AU have been implemented at state level and um, in the interest of time, I will not um, um, I will not say much of the most insightful um, points that you have raised. I would like to uh, uh, rush to our next speaker, to second, um, to hear your remarks on. Uh, given your expertise, would you shed light on um, prevention and mitigation methods that could be addressed?
that could be employed to um, address the trends we are picking up on the continent. And uh, what does what is the future of constitutionalism from your from your perspective uh, to bring this um, uh, phenomenon to, to an end? What are your thoughts on what other presenters have said? And uh, is there any perspective that the slightly different perspective that you may have uh, on this subject matter? Over to you, Atiseka. Um, thank you very much, Tendai, and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, let me begin by thanking the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria for inviting me to participate in this discussion. Um, this is a discussion that I believe is quite timely um, at a time when we see democracy declining globally. And I think um, as we discuss and, and constitutional changes of government in Africa, we really need to look at what is happening holistically across the globe, because it's um, the only way where we can start to find out and figure out how to mitigate, to prevent, or how to address um, this scourge of unconstitutional changes of government on our continent. Um, my organization, Freedom House, publishes the annual Freedom in the World report, which has been conducted since 1973 um, and covers 195 countries and 15 territories across the world. We publish this um, report on an annual basis and based on our measurements, countries are either rated as free, not free, um, or partly free. The report itself measures democratic freedoms under political rights, such as electoral processes, political pluralism and participation, functioning of government, as well as civil liberties, such as freedom of expression, freedom of association, organizational rights, rule of law, and personal autonomy and individual rights. Now, our 2002 report, which we released earlier this year, basically highlighted how global freedoms are under threat. They're under dire threat. Authoritarian regimes have become more effective at co-opting or circumventing the norms and institutions which are meant to support basic liberties um, and are providing assistance and aid to others to do the same. At the same time, we're seeing countries where they have been long established democracies um, being themselves failed by internal forces that are exploiting the shortcomings in their systems, distorting national politics, to promote hatred, violence, and unbridled power. This present threat to democracy is the product of what we see as 16 years of decline in global freedoms. A total of 60 countries suffered decline over the past calendar year in which we made, did our assessment, whilst only 25 countries improved. As of today, some 38% of the global population lives in countries that are rated not free by our Freedom in the World report which is the highest proportion since 1997, and only 20% live in free countries. When you look at our continent, Africa, 44% of the 54 countries measured are rated as not being free, 41 as partly free, and only 15% are rated as free. Now, why am I pointing this out? I'm pointing this out because we should not then be surprised that we have seen a raft of unconstitutional um, changes of government and popular out uprisings in the past few years. As democracy has declined, people's disaffection with political systems has increased and those who sit in power have sought to further entrench themselves. In 2021, the world experienced more coups than in any of the previous 10 years. And the majority of these, as we've heard from the presenters, took place in Africa. We also saw the number of power grabs carried out by incumbent civilian leaders also on the increase. So I think having given this kind of um, spotlight globally and also on our continent, I have a few thoughts which are based on what was shared by my, my, my colleagues on this panel, um, what we've heard, um, and also our own assessment as, as Freedom House. I think the first point worth noting, and I think this has been covered a little bit, is that relatively weak institutions and the absence of a democratic culture have facilitated the ability of incumbents to manipulate constitutions. Two, 
there is a misperception that all democracy requires is the regular performance of elections. But democracy also means more than what we call majority rule. Free and frequent elections as a constraint to government tyranny are necessary but have not been sufficient uh, to guarantee and guard liberties. And whilst elections have helped our African governments consolidate, deepen and entrench democracy, they have also paved the way for sustained majoritarian power to the detriment of the minority in many cases. And an example of this is um, in Cameroon. So although elections remain critical to the transition of a country from authoritarianism to constitutional democracy, it also can serve as a tool for the survival of authoritarian governments um, and authoritarian regimes. So how do we reverse this trend? Um, <laughs> this is not easy. I will start by saying that more than 10 of the heads of state that attended that extraordinary summit that took place in May to address unconstitutional changes of government had themselves either amended um, their constitutions to extend their term limits or had removed the term limits entirely. I think that's an important point to make as we talk about um, the African Union itself seeking to address these matters. Um, the challenge also is around the contention about what um, constitutes a coup. To date, the AU has only sanctioned military coups, even though there's a rough, wide draft um, and a wide framework that addresses unconstitutional changes of government. We have only seen two military coups being sanctioned to date, um, uh, and other unconstitutional changes of government have not been as equally sanctioned. And that's because there's little consensus on how to deal with these other unconstitutional changes of government. There's contention on how the AU should respond to coups after popular risings, such as uprisings, such as we've seen, we saw in Sudan in 2019, in Mali in 2020, and in Guinea in 2021. Um, how about uh, someone mentioned Zimbabwe where incumbents have been forced to resign under duress? Um, how do you deal with a country such as Eswatini where the king in 1973 changed the constitution to give the monarchy absolute power and banned political parties against the will of the people? So we have huge challenges before us, but I just wanted to make a couple of points around there is still some opportunity. I think the first one I wanted to mention is around citizen engagement and civic engagement. Um, the case of Sudan is an interesting factor where despite um, the, 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 in the weeks before the transitional government, which, which was scheduled to come under full control in 2019, the military seized power um, in October, 2021 and declared a state of emergency. There we saw um, General Al Bahan retaining control over the government and suggesting that elections would only be held in 2023. But under pressure from political groups and ordinary citizens, um, he, he has, his, 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 his hold on power has remained quite tenuous. And what we have seen have been massive protests against the coup, which have continued despite the, the, the army killing and security forces killing scores of people. Um, what is clear here is that the, the citizens in Sudan do not want a return to military rule, that they are willing to risk everything. Um, they have come out in the March of Millions movement demanding change in defiance of on, ongoing bloody crackdowns. Um, also looking at the example of Sudan when it comes to the role of civil society, um, we've seen Sudanese civil society play a, a key role first in the ousting of military dictators in 1964, 1982, then of course the general uprising in 2009. They have been very well organized and able to unify and mobilize the public towards a, a change agenda. And it's also been noticeable that whilst the political opposition has been the main driver in, in many um, of our African countries when it comes to democracy, in Sudan it's civil society and citizenry that are in the driving seat with the parties rallying behind them. And um, a unique development that we've seen there is the re recent revolutionary charter for the establishment of the People's Authority, which is a youth-led initiative, which is setting up a roadmap for the transition to power, uh, 
from the military to the to, to, to civilians. It is not an easy path. It is not an easy task. As I've said, thousands have died, but certainly it does provide an example for where sustained civic engagement, even if it's taking decades, um, can you know, bring about a return to de democracy and, and reverse an unconstitutional change of government with the will of the people. Um, I did want to conclude though that the challenge before us cannot be underestimated also in the face of uh, a lack of addressing the root causes of the disenfranchisement that we've seen across the board on our continent, the systematic um, corruption and impunity, which has led to leaders staying in power um, at, at, under fear of possible justice and accountability, following them once they leave their terms because of human rights violations. And so without urgently addressing what we can see as increasingly increasing repression of dissent, political opposition by autocratic governments, um, the impunity and corruption that goes with it that is fueling political crisis in our region, we, we cannot see a reversal of these trends. Um, and the hard work one progress that we saw in the 2000s, you know, related to justice, accountability, and the rule of law um, is unlikely to, 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 to return. Um, I'll, I'll quickly end there. Um, oh yeah, a, fi a final point, which is also quite depressing, and, and anchoring it once again in geopolitics and global developments, is that uh, many of you may have noticed that Xi Jinping of China um, is likely to get, to get a third term um, in the coming days, um, which means that he's likely to be a leader for life. So we should really not delink what is going on in Africa from de developments um, across the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Tseke. Um, this is very insightful and uh, I'm glad that you are giving, you're giving us numbers from the work that you do at Freedom of House, Freedom, Freedom House, and um, thank you for such insights. And um, it's very worrying that um, um, you, most countries from your findings, from your work are rated not free and only 50% of the countries are rated free. And this is the, and some of the issues why they are not rated free, um, a result why we have most of these issues to do with unquestioned change of government and um, and uh, instability in many parts of the continent. And also you pointed out about the issue of sanctions on the continent and that uh, the AU sanctions member states that violate um, unconstitutionalism, um, but in the past uh, scholars and um, organizations have noted that like you pointed out that there is lack of consistency in how these sanctions have been um, have been um, uh, conducted in, in, in as far as um, um, sanctioning the, the perpetrators of, of unquestioned or change of governments. So to our um, participants, um, you are free to pose your questions uh, on, um, on, on this subject and what are your thoughts and um, our panelists will respond. While I wait for you guys to, um, to pose your questions, I would like to pick a thought from Achieng. Um, Achieng, what do you think that, um, do you think that is there any, is there any time where our governments, um, we will trust civil society? Because you pointed a very important point regarding civil society, uh, that our governments, they have so much distrust with civil society. What's your take on that? What can be done better to improve um, civil society relations uh, with um, with our governments? I think it stems from um, our civil our government's distrust for their own people. That's where it stems from, um, and I think that distrust is, uh, I suppose you could say, we're in a catch twenty two situation that distrust uh, results from the fact that uh, people hold the power, not governments. Um, in terms of a social contract, the power is with the people, uh, but governments are always scared in, for their reasons of power retention or whatever it is, that the people will take back their power. Uh, um, and I suppose that, uh, 
tradition of repressing the people in order to maintain power uh, has extended also to their views on civil society. Uh, it's, it's not um, surprising that given the uh, analysis that Tiseke gave in terms of freedom around the world, we also have uh, quite a, a, a similar increase extreme increase in the suppression of civil society and increase in the laws that seek to suppress civil society action. Um, and I, I think that the only way to uh, uh, resolve uh, that issue is by increasing the democratic space in each of the countries. But we see that the democratic space for civil society organizing um, in many different forms is shrinking in, in all our countries. Thank you very much for, for such an insight. And uh, Tseke, you had indicated that you would like to leave early. Um, do you have any final remarks before I go to Dr. Trizo? Um, no, no, thank you. It's been a pleasure listening to everyone and um, I'm looking forward to further, further debate and discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for making time uh, considering your busy schedule. And Dr. Trizo, what are your thoughts? Um, what are you? What are you? What do you think could be the solutions given the nature of uh, challenges we are experiencing on our continent as regards to unconstitutional changes of government? Um, um, thank you, thank you, Tendai, um, for the floor. I before responding to your question, I wanted to to make two quick remarks. Um, the first one is uh, uh, listening to different. Uh, panelists, uh, different views here, you realize that we actually uh, share the same sentiment, the same sentiment in terms of what is not going on, uh, why unconstitutional changes of government uh, keep repeating on the African continent, why laws are not working, and why democracy is actually not working. So all our three uh, interventions uh, had similar, similar, similar points. But 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 the problem actually is because because I'm sure even those heads of states today who are changing constitutions, who are trying to remain in power, even those heads of state have been in the civil society and they have shared the same sentiments. Look at uh, someone like um, Alpha Conde, who completely changed the constitution in 2020 and remained in power and was uh, removed through a coup. This man has remained in the opposition for more than 20 years. He was in the opposition fighting against established the government. But the moment he got to power, he completely changed. It was the same thing with uh, the former president of Senegal, Abdul Awad. He was in the opposition for more than 20 years. But the moment he got to power, he completely changed. So what is wrong here? And in my view, as I, I, I highlighted uh, previously, the problem is the nature of the state that we have. The state has become an instrument of gaining rents and benefits and that we share to individuals to the point that uh, living uh, the cycle of power is like living your humanity because there is no other advantages you can get elsewhere apart from being in the state. So the only uh, role or the only thing you have to do is to maintain the police position of political leadership by doing right, by suppressing dissent, by sharing the benefits with the domestic cycle, but mainly with the foreign powers that are supporting you, whether it's France or the United States and others. So this is what we have to fight against. And uh, I, as I always said, and I will conclude with that, a theory of unconstitutional changes of government in Africa should align with the theory of what democracy is in Africa. If we understand what democracy is to us as Africans, uh, then we should try to ensure that the theory or what we understand as unconstitutional changes of government uh, in Africa reflects um, should be. So the second point uh, is, yes, I agree with uh, the previous speaker that uh, African states are aware of what is going on. They sign treaties, they they sign treaties and they ratify them. They, they sign declaration. The May declaration in Ghana was actually the last one, but uh, I, I don't disagree. But the only problem is that, you know, the inter international law is mainly made by states. So states do make uh, uh, these commitments. States always do that, always drop human rights provisions. And on the other hand, states are the same that violate those human rights instruments. So we cannot, in my view, 
uh, just assume that because it's uh, ratified treaties and um, signed declaration that they really believe in what is in those documents anyway. Uh, as one actually I saw on the chat someone mentioned, and this is uh, this has always been my, my, my view, state can just do that to look good or because they think that's the right thing to do. But, but on the other side, they don't really commit to that. They go and ratify. Rwanda has ratified the African uh, chart on democracy, but uh, the president has amended the constitution. Guinea has ratified the African chart on democracy, but they have amended the constitution. Cote d'Ivoire has ratified because here the measurement was the ratification as ratified by the amendment. So the point is you ratify, but you don't commit to the values that are in that instrument. And this is what is lacking. So what should we do uh, going forward? I think, I think, um, uh, change, as I pointed out earlier, change should come from within our states. Uh, we should try to empower uh, citizens to trans to influence uh, the position of leadership. We should not do this on the basis that those who are in power are only benefiting uh, from the state alone, and we should also get to power in order to, to benefit from that. That's what a number of classical civil society organizations have been doing. What they have been doing is that to fight the individual who are in power, like uh, the con they have been doing, but the moment they get there, they do the same thing. So there is no commitment, either from those who are not in power and those who are in power. So they share the same belief. The only difference is that one is eating, the other one is not eating. So we should change that by empowering our citizens to ensure that they can influence and to go to use democracy beyond elections. Democracy shouldn't just be a matter of voting every five years or four years, depending on the political uh, system. This, the empowerment of citizens will also try to, to actually reduce the strength of certain norms that are not aligned with constitutionalism, but which are in place at the domestic level. And when I look at those norms is to look, for example, in most Francophone countries where we've seen the coup d'etat, the issue of political regimes, the manner in which power is um, distributed within different states is also a problem in many states, especially Francophone states, which are applying a, a, a presidential, a hyper presidentialized system of government where the head of state uh, enjoys all the powers and they are there to appoint judges, members of the parliament to some point, members of the electoral commission, members of the judiciary, members of independent institutions, member of diplomatic corps. So the heads of states, when they have so much powers like that, it becomes difficult for them to understand that after 10 years, they have to leave power and give it to someone else. So we have to empower individuals to influence and change those norms. The other, the other uh, point is definitely the commitment to normative and institutional reforms that have been going on both at the domestic and the regional level. If we don't commit to, to, to those norms, if we don't ensure that our attitude, our behavior, our, our stance towards those norms also change with what is in, in, uh, on paper, then it will be problematic. We would rather, rather just let to, to sign and draft those new uh, instruments. So the other point is we should anchor the notion of um, African uh, unconstitutional changes of government in Africa in our day-to-day -day realities. So the definition of unconstitutional changes of government should reflect what is actually going on in, 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 on the African continent. And what is going on on the African continent is the fact that people are less and less participating in the management of public affairs. People do not have the voice. And the reason why military has to step in is the fact that not only people are not getting they have always heard, but also elections are just being misused. So how do we ensure that what we live, what we aspire to, and our attitude toward democracy is reflected in the way we define and constituents of government, not just because we need to, 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 to define something. So if we, as I said, if we align uh, that uh, perception, that theory to our reality, we will ensure that uh, people influence uh, the management of public affairs beyond beyond elections and the last point perhaps is to um is to see how we can strengthen our democratic institutions uh, uh we've seen through the third wave of 
constitution making in Africa in the early 1990s, the, the institutions of so-called chapter nine institutions, um, independent institutions, national human rights commissions, uh, public protectors, ombudsmen and uh, ombudsperson and so forth. So how do we strengthen so that those institutions, like we see in many cases in South Africa work effectively, sometimes against the established uh, powers. This is how I conceive the domestic solution to unresponsive changes of government. So the regional solution will just be supplementary to what is going on at the domestic level because the lack of democracy commitment and constitutional commitment at the domestic level reflects in how what is going on at the regional level. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trezo. Thank you for such a sound uh, analysis and um, a commentary on um, the issues that um, uh, we have been raised. Uh, before I go to the questions that have been that are put in the chat, I had a question um, for Chiang. Uh, you mentioned something to do with as regards to, to the will of the people. So I wanted you to elaborate a bit on whether the popular uprisings uh, contradict the will of the people, um, since it is enshrined in the African Charter that the will of people is, shall be the basis of, 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 um, and, uh, of government, as it also uh, stipulated in other international human rights uh, instruments. So what's your take on the will of the people and these popular uprisings demanding coups or supporting coups to happen? Um. Thank you, thank you, moderator. Thank you, Tendai. Um, so the will of the people um, is was the AU's way of responding to uh, what is popularly called the um, uh, the sorry, I, for, I forget the term. Um, Anyway, the, the 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 series of uprisings in the in the northern part of the continent, um, and I think to move away because uh, people rejecting leaders um, could easily have fallen within the definition of unconstitutional change of government in acting, but the AU gave a statement recognizing that um, the will of the people is is a legitimate. Uh, change or a legitimate form of change um, of government. And, and it's interesting that uh, uh, Trezor mentioned uh, Rwanda because um, I think Rwanda was able to use quote unquote, the will of the people um, to uh, get a petition signed by, I think it was almost 90 something percent of the population stating that they wanted uh, the current president to remain in office. Um, an interesting manipulation of the treaties. Um, and yet a, an interesting um, effort to remain within the uh, legality uh, of the treaty rather than ignore it completely which I thought was very interesting that um, uh, the president would have gone through such uh, extreme measures to, to stick within the legality of the treaty um, or the exceptions that had been made to, to the treaty. Um, and, and I suppose it's, it's negative, but I suppose it's also a development that um, leaders um, are trying to, and, and are really much cleverer nowadays. Um, in terms of how they steal elections and in terms of how they uh, accept the will of the people, quote unquote. Um, it's not the traditional ballot staffing that we used to have. It's not the um, uh, uh, crude, you know, arrogant methodologies that were used in the past. Uh, even military governments are negotiating for transitional periods. Um, so they're, they're, they're trying to legitimize their, their uh, taking over uh, of, of democracies. Um, so it's an interesting trend, but worrying, but also interesting, but also a development in terms of how unconstitutional changes of government are done on the continent. Uh, and I think we should also be aware that, um, like I said, governments know what they're doing and, and they're cleverer about doing it. 
uh, that they, than they were in the past. It's not pure brute force. It's now uh, some levels of manipulation um, as well involved. Um, I just want to, to reinforce something that Trezor said earlier about um, the link between political um, power and economic power. Uh, I think the biggest issue with our politics on the continent is that um, political power is the only way to economic uh, 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 prosperity. Um, and so when people get into political power, um, they're very willing to let go of it. I remember I had a conversation with someone, I think it was from Portugal or so, who said that they, the most of their citizens did not know who the president was because politics wasn't that important. They were more interested in um, the musicians and the movie stars who were making a lot of money. I think if, if on our continent there were other ways uh, to economic prosperity, uh, at least sustainably and in, 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 you know, generational wealth as we've seen. Um, most of the people who have generational wealth on our continent have acquired it through political links and political connections. Um, and, and, and from you know, being in the, in the close circle of the political elite. Um, and I think that's why we see many people, I think I would add Makisal to that equation. Uh, who come in from the opposition, they get into government and they begin to um, do all the things that they protested against when they were in the opposition or when they were not in power. Um, and, and, and linked to that is also the complexity of uh, the relationship between the citizen and the state. Um, the citizen more or less remains ignored for the five years. And then every five years, suddenly the citizen is important. Suddenly these politicians are paying attention to what the citizen is saying. Um, and, and I think um, in, in the difficult circumstances in which most of our people live, uh, that sudden, uh, I guess, burst of power or attention um, is what makes uh, people so volatile at election time uh, because that's the only time the citizens matter um, and and they, they do take elections very seriously and they do feel that um, the closer they get to political power, the closer they will be able to um, overcome their economic circumstances. Um, and it is those socioeconomic inequalities that drive um, a lot of our electoral related violence as well as unhappiness of citizens um, and the lack of diversity management as well. And these were acknowledged as well in the Accra Declaration. Um, I think in terms of uh, um, treaties and, and compliance with them, as, as Trezor mentioned, I would say the African Charter on Human and People's Rights has more or less universal declaration compared to uh, any of the other treaties. I think almost uh, probably 54, 55. I'm not sure if Morocco has finally deposited an instrument of ratification, but I heard that they were supposed to. So 54 or 55 at least countries uh, on the continent um, are parties to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Um, and so I think it says a lot that uh, we continue to see massive violations of human rights across the continent, despite this fact. Um, and I think we, the people, um, particularly those who um, have the knowledge and the engagement, maybe need to start reevaluating the relationship that we have with our governments and our states. Um, I think for most of our citizens, even people who are my peers, they don't necessarily see the government as being a servant to them. They see the government as um, parochial, uh, this traditional, uh, the father of the nation kind of thing who's benevolent to extend uh, assistance and, and economic uh, prosperity, quote unquote, to its citizens. Um, there are very few people who think of taxpayers' money as their own money. And because many of our governments have at least half of their uh, budgets funded externally, um, that link of accountability between people and their governments is tenuous at best. Um, and, and 
So our governments tend to do checkbox accountability to those who give them money and very little uh, practical um, uh, outcome accountability to their citizens. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much, Cheng. Um, such as um, a, a well thought uh, response. Um, thank you for, for that. I uh, would like to get to interact with what has been posted. We have 10 minutes to wrap up the session. So I will read up for what has been the questions or comments that have been posted um, in the chat. And then I'll give you the floor and, and Dr. Trissot the floor to give your closing remarks. So Tonderai Chipfurutse says, what deductions can be drawn from the AU response to unconscious unconstitutional changes of government regarding its commitment to address the problem of UCG. I think this has been answered. And Adika M. Daniel says, how will Africa as a continent manage to hold on its democracy in a work of multi-million companies and individuals who are now running wild across the African states to influence elections as to favor their business interests and desires which are not in line with democracy or people's wishes and aspirations. There is a rise in an appetite to control governments for self gains for, this major, for these major billionaires who trade in various goods across the continent. Is the African Union really necessary in the wake of what's happening to the continent with unconstitutional regimes, civil wars, unrest, and their less vocal than the French, Britain, American, yet it is the supreme African body for Africans. Yet is it the supreme African body for Africans? That was the question. And then finally, um, what can be done, the Stanley asked, what can be done to activate and commence the reporting mechanism under the Arctic? Um, so, that's, that's, um, those are the questions that have been posed. If you can perhaps comment in any of those and perhaps also uh, incorporate it in your final remarks as we close the webinar in the next nine minutes. So I offer to you, um, Achieng, then Dr. Trezo will give us the final uh, closing remark. Okay, um, I will start with uh, Stanley's question in terms of what can be done to activate and commence the reporting mechanism under ACTEG. I would say it has commenced. Um, last I had, there were five countries that had reported against ACTEG uh, to AGA or PAPS, um, but I, I would need to follow up and, and find out whether there are more countries that have submitted reporting under this. Um, I suppose. Ironically, Rwanda was the first to report um, under ACTIC. Um, in terms of Tonderai's question, um, is the response of the AU on unconstitutional change of government in synchronicity with the norms? I would say absolutely not. Um, I would say the AU has failed um, to uphold its own instruments. Um, its response has been sketchy at best, um, even where the, I suppose the chairperson has the capacity to speak against unconstitutional gov changes of government. That response has not been consistent. Um, there has been a time even the, um, the AU has been divided amongst itself. Uh, so for example, um, there was a time when it, there were issues uh, in Burundi yeah, relating to elections. Um, and the Peace and Security Council at the ambassadorial level um, told uh, uh, Burundi to shape up or um, they would be reported to the heads of state and government for sanctions. However, the heads of state and government came and reversed that decision and gave a more lackluster accommodation for Burundi which was very disappointing because it was one of the first times the Peace and Security Council had come out very strongly against a country where there was um, electoral manipulation. 
Um, and I think that sort of uh, back and forth um, has uh, also weakened uh, the AU as a response mechanism. Um, the AU has clear sanctions that it can impose on countries that uh, undertake unconstitutional change of government. Um, but it, it does this in, in very sketchy, very, um, um, and uh, suppose, um, what would you say, and non-systematic way. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that the AU has a lack of norms. Uh, I would actually agree that the response is what is severely lacking. Uh, and I, I, I would like to see more from the AU beyond high level meetings and um, extraordinary summits in terms of um, real consequences for countries that continue to uh, manipulate our democracies. Um, in terms of countries, um, oh, sorry, of companies, multi-million companies and individuals running wild uh, across the African state, um, I think it's not just influencing elections in their favor. I think it's also um, being able to extract resources from the continent to enrich themselves. Um, I would I would call for controversial methods. Most of these countries are headquartered um, in most of sorry these companies are headquartered in countries uh, that allow for us to sue them in their countries. Uh, so why not? take a, a tort action or some other um, civilian led action against these companies um, so that they're held in check from uh, having their interference on the continent. Um, that, that would be my personal opinion. Uh, maybe uh, Trezor has some additional intelligence to add. Thank you. Thank you, Achen, uh, much appreciated. Um, I hand over to Dr. Trezo for comments, observations, and uh, also build up from what um, Chiang and uh, the previous speaker um, have said. If you have any uh, thoughts as regards to that, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, personally, I'm glad that certain states have started to, to report under Article 49 of the African Democracy um, Charter, and as Acheng alluded to, uh, surprisingly, Rwanda started. And uh, was uh, interesting, but also uh, flabbergasting because uh, uh, when you see what is going on in terms of practicalities of all these norms, it's uh, exactly trying to look good while uh, internally you don't you don't uh, exactly do well. Um, uh, if you take uh, the same country. Um, its uh, position towards um, the African court was also surprising. You, uh, it ratifies the African court protocol, but then with you uh, and make a declaration uh, under Article 34.6 so that individuals can access, individuals and NGOs can access directly the African court against it. But when more and more petitions are being made against Rwanda before the African court, you see Rwanda withdrawing its declarations. And you know what is the argument? We did not know when we were uh, making the declaration under Article 34.6 that uh, dissidents or genocide denialists would be allowed to approach the court against Rwanda, which is something that comes from nowhere because nothing in the treaty uh, provides that. So I look at this reporting mechanism as a weak mechanism because um, it, Article 49 doesn't tell you, for example, what happens when you report. Um, it only tells you that the African Union Commission would summarize that report and submit to the assembly of heads of citizens and government through the executive council, uh, the implementation report and what then happens and there is no like discussion dialogue around this and then you do a follow-up so that is problematic if i try to to look at a similar reporting mechanism under human rights treaties and here i will point out under the african charter on human and people's rights article 62 and under the maputo protocol article 26 at least you see at that level a certain engagement between uh, among states the African Union, well, through the African Commission, and mainly 
civil society organization uh, in the NGO forum and other forums in order to discuss because civil society organizations are allowed to submit what we refer to as parallel or alternative reports. And do we have to submit alternative report to the African Union Commission on the implementation of the ACTEX? I don't know. And that's where the weakness lies, uh, the weakness lies. So that is really uh, pr problematic. And I hope uh, within uh, the union, they will try to make it more a more effective and compelling. So again, the other, the other weakness is that it seems to be binding, but not many states are doing it. And this is the same thing when you look at the African Charter and the, the Maputo Protocol. Many states are actually lagging behind their reporting obligations. And even when they report on the measures they have taken in order to implement those uh, instruments, the treaty and the protocol, you see that they've remained abstract in what they, are, they have done. It's more like we've achieved, we've adopted this measure we've adopted this treaty we've adopted this law we've adopted this uh we've uh, enacted this secular but what happens concretely states do not tell you. so that is the problem and the weakness with the reporting mechanism if you don't have strong accountability uh follow-up mechanism so the other question on what uh, on the influence of businesses uh, uh, on democracy and i think uh, again here that's where I will emphasize the role um, of civil society, not only those classical civil society organizations that are being used by rogue individuals to get to power, but civil society that really uh, care about the interests of the people, and not those civil societies that are there, uh, in some states, believed to, to uh, foster a certain agenda, but really the, both classical and new forms of movement the pro-democracy movement that have been able to to counter 13 agendas in senegal in congo in burkina faso that's where we have to rise against the hegemony the new form of hegemony from uh, multinational companies uh, and by multinational companies we should also look at how social media uh, companies facebook twitter uh, influence our behavior towards our state and towards our democracy. So there should be an accountability. But at the international uh, law level, I think there have been initiatives um, going on in order to develop a, a treaty on business and human rights and to see the extent to which these companies should be held accountable. But uh, the efforts uh, are still underway and we are. Identifying it with another thing and having it enter into force is a milestone to be achieved, and I'm not sure it will be done anytime soon because the same companies are rising against uh, against it. But at the domestic level, we know in countries such as South Africa, you have strong judicial mechanisms where you can act against against those multinational companies. So what the African Union should do, in my view, and the African Commission at its level is trying to do that is also to adopt a certain certain instrument in the area of extractive industry to see how to circumvent but i've not seen more in terms of the influence and the interference of these companies in democracy and uh, constitutionalisms although although it has been clearly demonstrated that most of these companies sometimes have been failing conflicts they've been supporting armed groups they've been supporting authoritarian leaders to remain in power so that their interests are uh, preserved. So I think uh, if Tendai allows me, perhaps I should use the same opportunity to conclude. Should I? Um, if I might just add something, Treza, to yes. something you said just now about the influence of these external companies on our elections. If I would speak for my country, Kenya, we have seen um, it is alleged that the same company that uh, supported Donald Trump's election was also present in supporting uh, one of our elections that uh, we believe was not free and fair. And so I think that influence, um, I think of, of multinational companies, um, their, uh, how they then um, do the PR and advise uh, mm -hmm. our government in terms of uh, creating a, citizen perspective perceptions mm. uh, by flooding our social media with false news i think has a huge impact on elections at least it did in kenya uh, during not the 
this year's elections, but the previous ones at least, we saw an active participation of the so-called PR group. Well, well I think what, one point uh, I forgot to add is also um, uh, the issue of the lack of synchrony between uh, uh, the African Union itself and um, uh, the regional economic communities and the mechanisms. There is kind of competition uh, between them. Uh, when you look at the conflict in Central African uh, uh, Republic, for example, you've seen a certain distortion of measure between the ECAS and the African Union. So that lack of synchrony, which also happened during the conflict in 2015 in Burundi, when Pierre Nkurunziza wanted to remain in power, and the East African community has taken already certain, certain measures, and the African Union Peace and Security Council coming to take other measures, and the East African community trying to, to, to reject those measures, the situation backfired, and you see it worked in favor of, 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 of Pierre Monko and Ziza. So how do we ensure that the, there is no competition between the African Union and the ECOWAS? Because sometimes also the African Union does not act and Rex acts uh, uh, rapidly. If you look at the conflict in the Gambia, the African Union was a bit reluctant to, uh, to, to take measures and the ECOWAS took the lead and uh, apparently the situation was resolved and Jaya Jame accepted to leave, to leave, to leave power. So oh, Afri the African Union should adopt a stance where it's not actually used by those uh, political leaders as a club of incumbent, as one author has pointed out, and it acts and reacts uh, uh, rapidly. Of course, theoretically, we know that regional economic mechanisms are more close to the conflict uh, zone and they are better placed to, to, um, to provide solutions that are adjusted to the reality. But uh, in doing this, we should just ensure that the norms that are at the regional level and the, the continental level are upheld. Uh, but uh, when you see the same African Union taking different stances when it comes to coup d'etats, for example, in Chad, there is a, a military takeover, like something like a dynastic takeover from father to son. Uh, in Chad, uh, the same thing that happened in 2005 in Togo, and in 2001 in, in, in Democratic Republic of Congo. And then the African Union suspending countries like Guinea, Burkina Faso for coup d'etats and not suspending Chad uh, because surprisingly of the influence of France and other, uh, all these other countries. So consistency is, is important in these measures and collaboration between African Union and regional economic communities. There was a framework, but this framework is not solid enough, especially in is on issues of democracy and um, uh, peace and security. So my conclusion then would uh, be something like, should we constitutionalize unconstitutional changes of government? Should we constitutionalize things like coup d'etats when they work for, for, for the better will of the people? When do we know that they do work for the will of the people? Or should we try to find alternatives or elections, or we will continue to follow the Western models of democracy. So I think it's time for, for Africans to see how to develop models that uh, work for us, not only for us as individuals who are in power, but individuals who are also in rural areas and who never know how things are managed in, in our country. Democracy, uh, the main assumption under democracy is that uh, the electorate is mature and it knows what it wants. Sometimes we realize that sometimes the electorate does not know what it wants. And as a change has pointed out, sometimes the electoral, electorate is misled in what it actually wants. You think you know what you want, but actually you don't know. It's the multinational companies that tell you what you want. And this has to change for us to have uh, sustainable solutions to ongoing trend of unconstitutional of government in Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you again for, for, for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Trizel. Um, thank you to, to our chain and to Tiseke for um, making your time to um, discuss this topical issue with us and with the rest of the uh, uh, people we have attended. Um, we really appreciate the insights and we hope to continue with this conversation in the coming year. And as we see that um, 
the schedule of high cost structure development is taking different forms and it's becoming very complex. So we hope to continue discussing this and um, seeking solutions to this. And thank you once again, everyone who has joined and we have come to the end of our webinar for today. We we'll see you next time when we have a webinar similar to this one again. Thank you very much. <laughs>